welcome to ABA Inside Track, Episode 2. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me are my fabulous co-hosts... I'm Diana. And I'm Dr. Jacqueline McDonald. So fancy. We got... Thank you. Oh man, I just gave like the Velveeta introduction. <laughs> you gave like the Brie and Grapes introduction. It's because I'm very sophisticated, as you will see. <laughs> you know she is. Well, two... She holds her pinky up when she drinks tea, guys. Uh, I'm drinking tea right now. Wow, two episodes in and we've gotten very high and mighty with our <laughs> content. <laughs> this week... Uh, we'll be talking about conditioned reinforcers in the social setting. We're going to start with the article by Dozier Iwata, Thompson Sassy, Wurzel, and Wilson, titled A Comparison of Two Pairing Procedures to Establish Praise as a Reinforcer, which is a topic that I think anyone who works with children with autism is very interested in hearing if there is a, a clear solution. So, Diana, why don't you tell us about this study? Okay, I can do that, although I don't know that I can answer the question you just put forth. I don't know if the article was completely able to either. It's it's still still a challenging subject, but I think we have some some good discussion points to lead us in a direction down the road as as a field. So I really liked this article, and I'm excited to get to talk about it. As I was reading it, I was really you know reflecting, and I feel like this article for me is um, it's finger licking good is the way that uh, I came to think about it, but and I feel like it works. <laughs> As a piece of chicken on two levels. Ooh. First of all... Wait, baked chicken or fried chicken? Oh, no, chicken? Jackie. Fried chicken. <laughs> Kentucky fried chicken. Oh. Because it's finger licking good. Okay. No, we're not... Baked chicken. <laughs> Have on. you guys been, like, working on this bit for a while? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you're, you're the doctor. Please continue. <laughs> That's right. And I'm allowed to draw whatever type of analogy I like. <laughs> yeah. So... It's like a piece of fried chicken because we have it's crunchy the actual on the outside. chicken itself. <laughs> it's crunchy on the outside. It's juicy on the inside. And I think we have some really nice, meaty, juicy results here, right? Mm -hmm. But there is another part to this article, too. So that's the first part, just the actual results, what they got from this, which mm -hmm. is a cool study. Mm -hmm. But there's the other side of it, too, which is... Crispy. <laughs> no, we covered that part. Oh. It's the 11 secret herbs and spices. Right? It's the recipe. Mm. And they delve into that in this article as well. Because they start to talk about all the background and all of the theoretical underpinnings of conditioned reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So there's two really juicy parts to this article. Have we been sponsored by the Colonel? I did not, <laughs> did not get we that. We got our first sponsor. <laughs> Guess who it is. <laughs> okay, well, let's... He's got white hair <laughs> and a mustache. It's Santa. Uh, all right. Ew. Well, let's let's get into the uh, <laughs> the uh, kind of the, the the gist of the article, the gist of the of of the study. All right. So I think it's I probably should talk about the herbs and spices first. Okay. Right. Because sure. that is what kind of leads us down the path here. So the question put forth by Dozer and colleagues is: first of all, why does conditioned reinforcement work? Right. And there are two hypotheses floating around out there. They spend more, a little bit more time on one than the other, <clears throat> but the first one is the traditional pairing hypothesis, which is you pair a neutral stimulus with a previously reinforcing stimulus or a primary reinforcer, pair them over time, and much like uh, what happens in Pavlovian conditioning, that second initially neutral stimulus is now going to function as a reinforcer, right, just through pairing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the first hypothesis. And yeah. I'd like to point out that Res Cola in 1988 would actually say that it's not about the pairing, it's about the association between the contingencies. So it's association between the stimuli um, oh, and the contingencies. Yeah. So they wouldn't necessarily call it a pairing. So this, I think, we should talk to uh, Miss Dozier uh, because yeah. Res Cola in 1988 made a very convincing argument that it's not about repeated pairing, it's about the association because it can occur at one time. So, I mean, it, it was the the, or the 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 thesis of that article more about the idea that pairing as a as a term yeah. is not appropriate, right? Okay, yeah. So, if you want to delve further into classical conditioning, that is a really great article. Ooh, Rescola, nineteen eighty eight. Huh? Pavlovian like, conditioning. You can get down the rabbit hole with that stuff, right? It's called Pavlovian conditioning. It's not what you think. That's really the name of the article. Yeah. Okay. It's awesome. That's from That's our nice. behavioral momentum days, <laughs> <Yeah>. right there. <laughs> okay, great. And then the second hypothesis about why uh, conditioning, condition reinforcement may work 
is the discriminative stimulus hypothesis, which says that, again, you have that neutral stimulus and the primary reinforcer, um, that the neutral stimulus comes to be conditioned and functions as a discriminative stimulus for the upcoming primary reinforcer. They don't spend as much time talking about that one. Mm -hmm. They sort of just put it out there as a postulate. They spend most of the time talking about the traditional pairing hypothesis. And they break that down even further into two potential hypotheses there. This was a very big uh, hypothesis article. It was a lot of... A lot. <laughs> I know. Lot. Yeah, I well, know. Yeah, and you're, therefore the chicken metaphor. I, mm-hmm. I get it now. Okay. It's juicy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are two types of pairing that's been studied in the literature. The first is stimulus-stimulus pairing. And uh, with this procedure, they simultaneously pair the neutral stimulus with the previously uh, determined reinforcing stimulus together. <clears throat> pair those over time in the absence of any response contingency on the part of the individual, which is pairing those two stimuli in their presentation. And they then test uh, just the now hopefully conditioned reinforcer. Uh, uh, against some new response that the participant hasn't engaged in in the past to see if it now functions as a reinforcer. So that's stimulus-stimulus pairing. There's no response required. It's just the neutral stimulus and the primary reinforcer together. And that is compared then to the response-stimulus pairing, which has also been shown in the literature. Both of them have been shown to be effective at different times. Um, But with the response-stimulus pairing, what happens here is again, those uh, neutral stimulus and the primary reinforcer are paired together. However, they're paired together and presented contingent on some particular response on the part of the individual. Mm -hmm. And um, so participant engages in response. Those two primary reinforcer, neutral stimulus are presented together. And they then use the same response that has been established with both of those and only provide the neutral or now perhaps conditioned reinforcer and no longer the primary reinforcer to see if that behavior then maintains with mm-hmm. just the conditioned reinforcer. And that's called the established response procedure. So Response what, stimulus. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so what they wanted to do here in this study was compare the two. And the conditioned reinforcer that they were really interested in was social praise. Mm. So that's what they looked at. Okay. I'm done talking about recipes unless you guys have questions. <laughs> I think it sounded really good. That was a really good synopsis of the introduction. I think that this actually introduction would be really nice as a compliment to one of your chapters in a book when you're talking about stimulus stimulus pairing or stimulus response pairing. Yeah. Because it gives good um a good segue into like what they are, how they work, good examples, without a lot of the floweriness that you usually mm-hmm. see in um article introductions. Yeah. They got everything in that they needed to. And, I mean, it was a little bit of a longer introduction compared to many studies, Mm -hmm. um, but it was because it was so juicy, so they spit a lot of stuff into a short Mm -hmm. amount of space there, which was nice. Um, So I think we could then move on to talk about the crispy, meaty part of the study. Let's go to it. So in this study there, it was broken into two studies. There were 12 participants total. In the first study, study one, there were four participants here. Um, All of them had a range of developmental disabilities. And uh, this study was looking at stimulus-stimulus pairing. So they were pairing a, <clears throat> excuse me, a primary reinforcer that was an edible of some type with a novel praise statement that they hoped sir, uh, would become to be a conditioned reinforcer. Now, I think the presumption here was that these individuals had certainly heard many praise statements before, right? So they couldn't use something like good job because the, there was a very good chance of them having history with that response. So they needed to pick some novel praise statements that they didn't think the individuals had heard before. Let me tell you what the examples are that are in the study. <laughs> so they list three, but they had to have at least ten for each of the participants. But the examples were, you go, girl. Get on with your bad self. And keep on rocking in the free world. Is it good? Good. Praise statements. Those are amazing. Do they add those to the list of 100 ways to praise a child? <laughs> they should. They, they <laughs> put those at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't know if you guys have... I'd love to expand on that list. Mm-hmm. You know, is there... What would you use as your novel praise statements were you to need to? Oh, I think 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of like, oh, snap. But that, that's usually kind <laughs> of like, oh, you screwed up. So. Yeah. That's but, like but again, snap, it's novel snap, phrase snap. statement. Yeah. I, w- I will pair it uh, with, could, with other situations it's, maybe. If it's previously it neutral. Yeah, it shouldn't You shouldn't can matter. use anything. Oh, oh snap. Shamoun. Oh, my. That's great. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. So when I initially thought about this, what first came to my mind was the rapper Ludacris. <laughs> And so it's Jackie, that, Jackie loves rap. I I love the rap music. Um, and so I think it would be like what Luda. So that's what I would do following any correct responses. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember what other sound that you know, like when they when they're rapping and they're huh. like, oh, that. So I would do that too. So those types of sounds um, I would do after. And maybe like a high pitched E, like wee, like that. Oh yeah, that, so that would be fun. <laughs> do the Arsenio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are all things that I would definitely do. Um, also, I think it would be really fun um, if we used like audio clips of like famous old actors, like Richard Simmons, and he was like, <laughs> "Let's just sweat it out." Like that would be pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's, That's good. Great. We, we have so much technology. I'm glad we're using it for, for good, good things <laughs> yeah. like old audio clips for the children. <clears throat> I mean, I, I do appreciate it when I hear, you know, teachers out and about uh, trying to come up with novel praise statements. But I, I have to say I heard winner, winner, chicken dinner mm. the other day in the hallway. And uh, that for me is not a neutral stimulus at all. No. It's definitely Guy Fieri. <laughs> but I mean, maybe that, that maybe Guy Fieri is a... Functions as a reinforcer for that individual. I don't know. The child might like diners, drive-ins, and <laughs> yeah. discos Who knows? or whatever. Who knows? <laughs> I shouldn't judge, but it's true. Reinforce, you know, everyone's reinforcer. It's a little bit different. <laughs> we should respect that. You're, you're right. It's, it's all it's all about the responding. I now. got the rap lovers. <laughs> good, good. Soldier boy. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a rapper. Um, all right, so they found ten novel praise statements for each of the individuals, <clears throat> and they uh, they. Looked at um, initially a baseline phase in which they provided no type of reinforcement for responding. They looked at a praise only phase in which were responding to occur, they would have provided a praise response. However, there was very little responding that occurred in that condition. They then um, did a pairing condition, no response required, uh, just paired the edible with the neutral praise statement, and then they followed that up with a the praise condition again, where if responding occurred, it would be. uh, reinforced with the praise statement. So I'm going to interrupt you for a minute. Yes, ma'am. And tell you two things. One thing that they did, one thing that I wish they did. Okay. Okay. So they did do a reinforcer test on the edibles. So they made sure that the edibles did function as reinforcers by using switches and seeing, you know, following a continuum on a switch press, did the edible actually serve to strengthen the switch press. So I like that they did that. What I wish they would have done is done a preference assessment or even a reinforcer assessment on any sort of praise prior to starting the summer. Uh, prior, to, prior to starting this study, um, I know yeah. I know that they do the baseline condition and then they have praise only. But I don't know. I just would have liked to see that just because they are looking mm-hmm. for praise. I I see that they have it, but I don't know. Maybe it would have strengthened their assertion a little bit more. Now, having never done a praise preference assessment Mm -hmm. how would one go about doing that so i've done them by having switches when you press the switch it's like either a picture of me saying something Mm -hmm. with a paired with a physical action or the switch actually activates the sound of me saying like great job or Mm -hmm. you are great like those types of things uh so Mm -hmm. that's what i've done when i've done a praise preference assessment and are you familiar with um maybe at all social reinforcer assessment where they had um, participants hand over tokens for uh, praise was one of the conditions. Wow, when, when was that? That was 2000 something. Don't know. We'll have okay. to look it up. But it, it was it was it was a, it was a while ago at this Krista, point, right? Yeah. yeah. What year? Uh, they uh, the response was handing over a, to- a token chip, like a poker chip, mm. and they looked at uh, resp- how, what the rates of responding were for two different physical social. Reinforcers like head rubs or tickles, and then also social praise mm-hmm. as compared to a baseline condition. Okay. So it's just a method of assessing social um, attention as a reinforcer. Well, we got to start using those in, in in my job. It's hard. We everyone is like a forced choice because you can train it really easily, but uh, it's so limited. 
It's like a fun social thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It can be hard because it's hard to represent visually. Right. What I liked and what I wish they would have done. And I'm not sure it would have helped at all. I mean, it wouldn't have changed the results. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least it would have strengthened the assertion that praise, the praise that they use actually didn't function as reinforcers. Yeah. Um, because if you look at the at the graphs, the participants barely contacted the contingencies right. in that praise only condition right. because they didn't engage in the response. Right. So I just would I just would like that just a little bit more. Mm. Maybe that's that's just me, but Yeah. And we presume that they were perhaps um you know, recommended for this study because, because they didn't think right. that they had mm-hmm. actual Absolutely, yeah. mm-hmm. um condition reinforcers, but it would be nice to know for sure. Yeah. yeah certainly. All right, so results of that study um, three of the four participants showed no change in their responding from the initial baseline or praise only condition, which was zero or near zero rates of responding, um, despite the stimulus stimulus pairing. And then the um, the final participant initially did show some responding in the uh, excuse me the praise only condition, <clears throat> um, but that responding kind of tapered off over time, so it didn't really maintain. Mm-hmm. So overall, uh, they felt like stimulus stimulus pairing was a bust mm-hmm. for this for this study. For this yes. study, yeah. yes, exactly. So and they it had been uh, thousands thousands of pairings when they were all said and done. It was between sixteen oh yeah thou- oh, no excuse me sixteen hundred and twenty four hundred pairings right. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of pairings. <laughs> it's a lot of pairings. <laughs> Mind if that Get was... on with your bad self. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if that was wine and cheese pairings. <laughs> oh, oh, ja- oh, Dr. Jackie. <laughs> I'm just hungry. Uh, I, I, can we, I want to remember we come back to the, just, just that because it's it sort of, it's one of those, one of those pieces that I, I don't know if it, it fed into the final results as much, but just the idea of the pairing and how I think we as, as, as educators think of praise. Oh, just always add praise to everything and it'll yep. all be fine. And then you're that secretly like, it's not all going to yeah. be fine. Someday it'll <laughs> stick. Right. And maybe, I think they even mentioned, they're like, it could have gone more, but after 2400, you're really not <laughs> getting the results you want to see. That yeah. is true. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like such a phony. I've told everyone for so many, all these young 22 year old people, like, just always praise and it'll all work out. Well, hang on though. Oh, okay. Because are you telling them to do that just willy nilly, paired with skills Always. that fall from the sky? No. Or are you telling them to do that following? We some don't have response? the funding for, for the skittle shooter anymore. <laughs> you know the, that. Taste the rainbow. <laughs> what? They have some weird commercials. They do. Yeah, they really have a good marketing team. <laughs> skittles, call us. Yeah. All right. Our second sponsor, <laughs> Skittles. Taste the rainbow. But I bet you used to miss. Use response stimulus pairing, Rob. I bet that's, that's what you're possible. heading. Yeah, it's possible. No, I do. No, you definitely do. I definitely do. Because you're usually not providing skittles just willy nilly. You're usually doing it contingent on. But you on know response. what? No, true. I think there's been more of a push, at least with some of my coworkers, to focus on the stimulus stimulus pairing, oh. uh, which to me, as in this study, has always felt like. A little bit like wishful thinking. Mm-hmm. If we just do this long enough, it's just going to happen. And I know that there is research to back it up. However, I know there's plenty that shows it might not be the strongest way to make uh, your conditioned reinforcers come about. So I can presume that you are not the king of wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's you guys are going to write comedy bits. You have to tell me before we start recording. Thinking. Who is that? Chris Isaac? <laughs> is he in a rowboat? <laughs> I know I will. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is the last episode, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, We've been know. yanked from the airwaves. The stress of podcasting has gone to their heads. <laughs> All right. So stimulus, stimulus. <clears throat> yeah, I was not, working not on my segue into response stimulus pairing. <laughs> I, had, well, I had something I wanted to talk about. That's all. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. I, I, I didn't mean to break your flow. Oh, it's good. It's good. So, uh... That's where they moved on next, was to study two to look at response stimulus pairing and the um, potential effects of establishing a condition reinforcer under that paradigm. So in this um, half of the study, they had eight participants, and um, it was set up a little bit differently than the previous study in that they did an alternating treatments within um, a multi-treatment design. So they compared a baseline in which there was 
um, no reinforcer going to be provided for a response, a praise-only condition, and those were, like I said, alternated. Uh, responding remained low for all participants across those conditions. And they then implemented response stimulus pairing in which the both of the reinforcers, the neutral praise statements, such as, you go girl, and the edible reinforcer that had been identified as a reinforcer, were paired contingent on the production of the target response. They saw behavior occur for all eight participants under those conditions, and then they went back to the previous baseline versus praise only conditions. And for four of the eight participants, responding immediately decreased back to zero. So response stimulus pairing for this group did not produce a condition reinforcer. Mm -hmm. At all. It went literally right back to zero for all of the participants. Yep, zero. It's kind of amazing, like, how quickly they were like, nope. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, maybe they responded once. once. Alicia responded once. One time. It's pretty funny. Everyone else was like, Rick "Uh -uh." responded once. Right. This is the part of the show where I describe the graph. So they're like really low, and then they go up, 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 and then low again. Right. Flat. You got it. Zero. You got it. However, for the other four participants, they saw responding maintain Mm -hmm. in the praise only condition. That was very exciting. Yeah, it was. Because that meant that they had a response that was most likely. Uh, maintaining under the newly established condition reinforcer of praise. Mm -hmm. So, Diana, I wonder what uh, the difference was between the three participants that the condition reinforcement worked for and those that it didn't work for. That's a great question. You know, I went back and looked at the participant demographics that we were given. It didn't really tell me that much, is Mm -hmm. the short short version of that story. Um, Like I said... The individuals in this study all had some degree of developmental disability. They were all adults, except one that was 17. And they also gave us information on their receptive and expressive ability, so everyone could follow minimally one-step instructions and could communicate using gestures, um, sign, or vocal-verbal response. For the, the, the four for whom we saw... Social praise is be established as a condition reinforcer. Three of the four only had moderate um, developmental disability. One had severe. And they all could follow three to five step instructions. Hmm. So it's, you know, I'm sure they tried to uh, balance the groups. They don't actually give any information about how they determine who is going to go where. Um, but it's possible that those participants were maybe perhaps a little more in tune or interested in social interaction or contingencies. We really don't know. We don't have much information to go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That would have been interesting, though, because that's something that could have helped us kind of, you know, tease out why it worked for some participants and why it didn't. But we'll we'll never know Mm -hmm. unless we do more research. (laughs) I'm sure there will be. There's got to be more research, right? Right. Yeah, right. Um, And one more thing to note is that for the, the four for whom it worked, They also went on. They didn't stop there. They also looked at additional responses for those two groups. So um, for each of those four participants, they were able to uh, um, have responding occur for two other responses that had never been reinforced with the food item. So they were reinforced only with the social praise statements. That's crazy. Um, and I think it comes back to to your question, Jackie. Of that sounds if you just shared those participants, it sounds like we got it. We found the secret right. of making praise a reinforcer. But then knowing that pretty much half of the other participants just nothing, right. nothing came of it. Yep. You know, you, you're getting closer to the to the answer. But what's the what's the variable? What's what's right. keeping this from being successful? Because I think one of the you know certainly being in in a school system. You get some people who are very much about, you can use edibles, you can use tangibles, but, you know, even beyond sort of best practice trying to minimize those, I've had plenty of of people I've consulted with, like, this behavior is not going to go up based on just your saying good job, we have to look at other things, and there's oftentimes flat out refusal, and you're trying to explain, if not why praise isn't effective, maybe how it could become effective, but then Mm -hmm. even so, like I said before, the sense that I'm just sort of trying to give them some hope that it could be effective but i'm not sure that it that it will be and and this is you know nice to know that i'm not totally spinning my wheels just, but 
but the the why still seems very elusive. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's hard because socially mediated consequences aren't reinforcing for a lot of people. Uh, when not, Di and I were talking about this, I was like, oh, I wonder if it's a condition reinforcer for me. And then we decided that it's definitely not. That <laughs> so, Jackie was so, born smiling. Yeah, so social, <laughs> social reinforcement is a primary reinforcer for me. Right. Um, <laughs> so I don't think anyone had to pair it with, with anything. Um, but for some people, even for typically developing people, I think sometimes you do have to pair it uh, quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't think it's a, a disability alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. issue. Yeah. But, I mean, we've all seen the difference in acquisition of skills when you have a reinforcer in place that is truly a reinforcer. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being able to initially establish behavior with something that is highly motivating and clearly a reinforcer and preferably a primary reinforcer can make all the difference in the world. And it's often, you don't even need it for that long. You know, mm-hmm. you can quickly establish something um, while you're doing that use a method like this, work on pairing it res- through the response stimulus method um, with things that you would like to become reinforcers down the road, um, and then try and fade those primary reinforcers out as quickly as you can. Mm-hmm. And It's amazing when it works. It doesn't always work, but when it does, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing to behold. So kind of thinking big picture, if one were to say, all right, I'm going to add you know, components of this to my practice. So, you know, working with children, working with adults, working with any type of student or any individual, would you say that this would lend more ammunition in the sense of best practice is going to be focus on, um, you know, focus on the um, response stimulus? Pairing. Yes, the response. Yeah. So uh, would you say that focus on the response stimulus pairing, if you're going to do it, do it with response stimulus pairing? Is it different f- depending on what you're pairing? I mean, it, what's what's well, your sense? I think that the the literature is mixed on this right mm-hmm. now. So we have yeah. seen effectiveness with stimulus stimulus pairing as they, sh- they, they demonstrate in the introduction. Mm-hmm. We have seen some success with response stimulus pairing. So maybe a quick little assessment uh, prior to, you know, going all out, I guess, mm-hmm. in, in your, you know, in your session with a, with a client's, to see or look back at any previous histories of, you know, acquisition and see, you know, is it always something? <laughs> it's always something. It's always something. But if you can look at the past histories of reinforcement and see, you know, when acquisition was more efficient or effective mm-hmm. um, and use that as your cue to what you should use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And to me, it's best practice, you know, anytime that you're using like I said, some type of primary reinforcer that you would intend to fade to go ahead and start this process of pairing it with something else to oh, sure. potentially replace it. So yeah. right. that's what I would recommend. And condition reinforcers are really important, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like, the world survives on condition reinforcement. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't go to work without condition reinforcers. That's true. And praise is, you know, especially praise is, is a potential condition reinforcer. I mean, it's free mm-hmm. and easy it's super easy and it has i think it has other effects too uh not just on the individual who's receiving it as your hoping conditioned reinforcer i think it right it also is a nice cue for you know if you're working with other people they they hear you making praise statements they're more likely to make praise statements <laughs> uh i know for me the more i'm like this kid's driving me nuts i can't do this the more i'm like this is the you're the best you know it it, it, it does it does somehow reinforce at least my own behavior i think my novel praise statement would be to infinity and beyond. That's a good one. It would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, Any other, I, Jackie? I know you mentioned, you know, not necessarily a limitation, but something that you you uh, sort of uh, looking at some of the preference assessment at the beginning to make this, to, well, to, to sort of increase the level of. Uh, for, no, it's turn. like strengthen the assertion of the results. Okay. Really, uh, I'm looking because I think that would just show us more if they could demonstrate that. Praise prior to this actually did not mm-hmm. uh, serve as a reinforcer. Yeah. Um, would just kind of strengthen it right. just a or little Or perhaps more. doing an assessment, like I mentioned, comparing different types of potential right. social reinforcers to Absolutely. see if one might be more effective would mm-hmm. have been maybe a nice... Yeah. Right. Could, could be a nice extension. Right. And maybe not even looking at praise, but also like any other type of socially mediated... Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. 
reinforcers. Because maybe they're not sensitive to praise, but they might be sensitive to, you know, physical contact or mm-hmm. any type of, like, facial expression. So right. So we could look at that. Because that's what we're really looking for is, is something that's, you know, I don't want to, it's more typical. Could we use that as a condition reinforcer? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the course of that assessment, I was talking about the SMABI et al. Um, we encountered someone who really liked whispers, like, like secrets, and you'd like whisper something. Who would have thought, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Change the tone of voice. So SMABI et al. was published in 2007. Okay. What's called Assessment Protocol for Identifying Preferred Social Consequences. Mm-hmm. SMABI et al. 2007 in Behavioral Interventions. Okay. Great. Way to go, Krista. <laughs> <laughs> now, Diana, I, I know when we when we first were talking about this article, uh, I know you'd, you'd noted that none of the participants were on the autism spectrum. Only one was on the autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. Everyone else, uh, well, they just talk about them having some type of general developmental delay. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a really good point and I, that we hadn't brought up yet is how well do we think these types of results would generalize over to a population that is perhaps uh, less sensitive to social contingencies or less likely to find those reinforcing. Mm-hmm. We don't know. No? So ripe for replication. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, to follow up from this study, they felt that in their particular case, <clears throat> response stimulus pairing was more, much more effective than stimulus stimulus pairing although still not effective for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, They also noted their fantastic results and that they were able to have additional responses. Uh, I don't don't want to say they were shaped because they were responses that were already in the individual's repertoire, Um, but they occurred uh, with only praise as the reinforcer and were maintained under that condition. So that was pretty exciting. Um, And they highlighted that a couple of times because they noted that there has been literature in the past suggesting that these types of conditional stimuli do not function as response strengthening stimuli on their own, that they always need to be paired with the primary reinforcer. And in this particular study, that was not the case for those secondary responses that they measured. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And they felt like that is, um, was, was new, mm-hmm. new to the field. All right. I do think if you are looking for an article to replicate on how to write a good introduction, methods, results, discussion sections. This is a really nice article to read and replicate. I think it was excellently, excellently well. It was it was well written, uh, and right. I think that I'm going to use it as a template on my next publication. Just just to find, replace, and take out stimulus, stimulus, <laughs> right? and put whatever you're actually studying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but I think you know, like sometimes when I when you're reading articles, you're like, well, this is. Kind of crappy, mm-hmm. um, but this is actually a really well written article. That's right; it's finger looking good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I know as as the as the um, the working class stiff BCBA, I definitely appreciate an introduction, especially on a topic that you know it's not necessarily you know the hot thing. It's always nice to get a good a good reintroduction or a good review, uh, and it, and then especially when you get more more depth than just here's the thing, and it worked for a bunch of. You know, work to increase this and then just a ton of citations. It's really right. nice to have the background information yeah. and then have uh, a really thought-provoking, you know, almost pre, pre-research pre article discussion going on with Yeah, uh, with they the did topic. the synthesis for you. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't just put the research out there and were, you were left to draw your own conclusions. Mm-hmm. They tied it in so nicely to what's already been done and um, the larger, like I said, theoretical underpinnings of why condition reinforcement happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I liked it. Okay. Any other thoughts on this article? Any other ideas for extension or areas that you f- you feel uh, would be would be beneficial to to explore or to implement in practice? Certainly, I think we want to see uh, what this looked like with a population with autism, mm-hmm. as we mentioned. Um, <clears throat> to continue down the path of you know, parsing out stimulus, stimulus versus response stimulus, there's a lot of other things you could look at besides social reinforcers. So, you know, were you to want to examine that and maybe look at it from a more translational perspective, then you could expand that to look at tokens. Mm -hmm. Um, Money. 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 Money was a huge condition reinforcer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think tokens especially, just in terms of 
they are they are almost as ubiquitous as money. It seems. Right. Any program, it's like everyone's got tokens. I mean, tokens just you know you're throwing them around. And right. And when people that- stop and actually you know try to break that down and see if the tokens are condition reinforcers, guess what? They're not. Yeah, they're not. They, they very rarely are. Yeah. And I think that you know to follow up, Diana really had a boom moment. In this article? Oh, my gosh, yes. You almost forgot your boom moment. I know. Well, I wrote it down. I mean, I I didn't write the boom moment. I just... Uh, she wrote, <coughs> wrote, wrote the word I wrote boom. boom. <laughs> it's right I there on the notes. I kind of described it already a little bit. Um, but it's, it's, they, they go over that in the textbooks that we typically look at, they indicate that condition reinforcers are um, typically established through pairing. Um, however, in this current study, they highlight that this process of condition reinforcement establishment is probably much more complicated than that of simple pairing. It is unclear that the outcome is one in which praise actually functions as a condition reinforcer. It's much more complicated is basically the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, before we move on to our next article, I want to remind anyone at home who is listening and would like to earn continuing education credits for your, for your listening and your thoughtful participation of our first code word. Uh, Now, remember, if you are interested in receiving CEUs for listening to this episode, you can go to the website, abainsidetrack.com, and click the link, Get CEUs, to find the full instructions. But the short of it is, you will need to have the two code words hidden in this episode if you would like to receive CEUs, because we really want to know that you've listened to the whole thing rather than just downloaded it, immediately deleted it, and then uh, sent us a you know, <laughs> sent us a quick note. No for one would CEUs. ever do that, Rob. Listen Not that the, just in case some sort of mirror universe evil BCBA with a goatee. Not that they have, all goatees well, are we'll evil. We'll cover but, that yeah. in our upcoming ethics. Ooh. Episode. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, now everyone wants to listen. So, in any case, the first keyword is Scotland. S C O T L A N D does not have to be capitalized, just Scotland. Where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the next article. Establishing books as conditioned reinforcers for preschool children as a function of an observational intervention. And this was by Singer Dudek, Oblak, and Greer in uh, Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis in 2011. Now, this is a very fascinating idea, and certainly reading the title, my first thought was, this doesn't sound like something that would work. <laughs> it's true, actually. <laughs> I can't believe that it worked, to be honest. Um, when looking at it, uh, I think to myself, wow, that actually worked? Like, I am going to, right? I want to try to use that always. And actually, the first time I read this article was about five years ago. Um, and mm-hmm. I think I forgot. In 2011? And, <laughs> oh, duh. And I remember, because I was supervising a classroom of children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, and I read the article and I was like, oh my gosh, I think I just like deleted in my brain the fact that it was done with typically developing kids, and mm-hmm. I just assumed that it was done with children with autism. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm totally doing this. And I tried to, mm-hmm. and, it, and it failed miserably. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, but, these guys had a, had a delay. Yeah. But not autism. Mm-hmm. But not autism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it, it failed miserably. But, you know, I love the idea. And there are yeah. so many ways you can actually use this. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But So, Jackie, why don't you give us the, the introduction and, and, and set up the research for us? Yeah. So, really, what they were looking at is... They had done a a brief literature review about all of the articles demonstrating that stimulus-stimulus pairing had been effective. Um, And what they say is that, yes, it is is very effective sometimes, uh, but it's really time-consuming. What, we took like 1,200 pairings or 2,400 pairings, what we were talking about before, and that didn't even work. Mm -hmm. um, And also, they saw that there was a lack of generality across settings. So... They, they haven't demonstrated generality to other reinforcers when they're using this stimulus-stimulus pairing. Uh, Greer and Sitter Dudek in 2008 conducted a study trying to look at how they could use other methods to establish a condition reinforcers. Um, and they kind of drew from some of the literature on observational learning um, mm-hmm. to help facilitate 
this new procedure that they were using. And Jackie, if I'm not mistaken, your dissertation research was on observational learning. Yeah, my dissertation uh, research was on observational learning. And I do like to point out in the beginning, as the authors point out in the discussion, that this article is not an example of observational learning. Okay, great. Um, gotcha. So it may seem like they're postulating that this article in the beginning in the introduction is driven from uh, like the theory of observational learning, but it absolutely is not, and they do state that in the discussion. Um, so here they're just using an observational intervention, mm -hmm. um, whereas observational learning you need to observe the response and the contingencies, okay. um, and you have to observe the response under the contingencies that produce positive reinforcement and uh, a response that will likely not produce reinforcement. Um, so this is not an example of observational learning. Right. Um, so they, that's why they term it an observational intervention. All right. and the, but that's because they were, not, they were only observing their uh, Confederate peer just Receive. after they'd received the reinforcement? Yeah, so, so their first uh, experiment was conducted in 2008, and so they had six preschoolers with a language delay, um, and they found that discs and string did not serve as reinforcers. Um, but then... Discs? Discs, like probably Like tokens. floppy discs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like AOL CDs? <laughs> right. I think, yes. They found that AOL CDs... <laughs> came in um, the mail. I think probably what they were talking about were like tokens. Probably like a bingo. Okay. Chip. We found this crap in the bottom of a drawer and decided <laughs> I mean, that to make an experiment. Yeah. stimulus. And then they said string for one participant, right? Okay. So these did not function <laughs> okay, um, as I see. Forces. Okay. For these six participants with language delays. And so the intervention just consisted of the six learners observing their Confederate peer receive the discs and or the string uh, following a correct response. But it's important to note that the uh, learner did not uh, observe the Confederate engage in the response. All they saw was uh, the Confederate receive the disc and or the string. Mm -hmm. So what they noted, as a side note, is that once they saw the Confederate, once the observer saw mm -hmm. the Confederate uh, receive the distance string contingent on those correct responses, that then the learner tried to reach for the discs, tried to grab the string, asked for them, mm -hmm. um, and then following, that was the intervention, basically just watch somebody else get it. <laughs> and, watch and play with string. Yeah, watch and play with string. And then, so following the intervention, then they assessed if those thing, if those items were now reinforcers, and they found out that they were, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so these must be individuals that have a history with this type of very clear reinforcement contingency it, in the context must. of a work program. Right. Mm -hmm. And I do think that they didn't say it here because it was the replicate, but the, this current study actually does say that, that they do have a history yeah. of that sort of... Uh, they have good instructional control mm -hmm. um, in the classroom. Okay. Um, but the current study that we're going to be talking about is extending and replicating this uh, Greer and Singer Dudek uh, 2008 article. So they're replicating it by using the exact same procedures, um, but they're extending it because they're assessing uh, generality in different settings. Mm -hmm. So another way that they are replicating it or extending it is using uh, educationally uh, relevant materials such as picture books and mm. not things that we find in my drawer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, so they wanted to see the if contents they... contents of the bottom of your purse. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see what I have here. Lipstick. A mento. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. It's an old apple core. <laughs> Some receipts. And yeah. a paper clip. <laughs> Research. <laughs> Um, so they wanted to see if they could uh, condition, use, they could condition books as reinforcers. Yeah. So they had three preschools. Which is a noble task. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah cause every a lot more social validity to your, my child now likes books than my kid loves string. <laughs> yeah, it's great. No, I think nobody would like that. <laughs> right. So in this study, we had uh, three preschool children, and they had mild to moderate language or developmental delays. Uh, they all received a diagnosis of preschooler with a disability. As designated by New York State. Yeah, I was going to say Thanks, yeah. New York State. something special, I guess, for New York. Right. But because they had this diagnosis of preschool with a disability, they qualified for early intervention services. Um, but it doesn't seem like they had a lot 
of deficient skills. They certainly didn't go into... Well, they list what they can do. Yeah, they can do a ton of stuff. Like, (laughs) Katie, she's four. She can tact. She can count to 20. She can identify letters, numbers, colors, trace letters, numbers, and shapes. But during her free play, she played with toys and dolls Mm -hmm. and just didn't look at books. Um, I don't. There's something about when I read research and I'm looking at the participants and they're like, "And this kid was the best." And here we, it's like, "Oh, I'm <laughs> right. okay. It might not be helpful for me." So, um, all of the all of the participants earn tokens throughout the day and exchange tokens for some preferred items. Um, and casually, the teacher noted that none of the participants would exchange their tokens for books, um, but they would. You know, exchange them for like dolls and mm. blocks and that sort of things. Um, they had three other preschool children that served as com- uh, as peer confederates. Um, they were not classmates of the participant, um, but they did attend the same school. Mm-hmm. Then they basically replicated the uh, procedures done by uh, Greer and Dudek Singer in 2008. So they had a pre and post observation intervention. Um, what what was kind of interesting is that they looked at both maintenance tasks and acquisition tasks. Mm-hmm. So first they looked at maintenance tasks, um, and they did a pre uh, observation uh, pre observational intervention where they just looked at responding to maintenance tasks um, with books as reinforcers. They looked at both food as a reinforcer and books as a reinforcer. Right. Yeah. So phase B <clears throat> was books as a reinforcer, mm-hmm. and phase A. Uh, was food as a reinforcer. And then they did their intervention. And books did not work. Mm. Right. The pre-intervention. Right. But we haven't talked about the graph yet. Oh, I thought we were talking about graphs. No. sorry. Procedures. It's okay. So in the pre-observational intervention, they looked at both maintenance tasks and acquisition tasks and either provided books contingent on correct responses or food contingent on correct responses. Then in the intervention phase, the target participant observed the Confederate student receive books contingent on correct responses, but it's really important that they saw only the delivery of the book and not the Confederate engaging in the response. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that nice large divider, and it was a tabletop task. So. Right. Yeah, so you couldn't see over it. Yeah. Even if you tried. <laughs> <laughs> they are preschoolers, so they couldn't get that high up. But it wouldn't be funny if they were, like, climbing. They're like, I'm looking! I just love the idea of, like, I've got this giant, like, T-square. I'm going to stick it right between all yeah. you kids. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> um, yeah. And then they had a post-observational uh, intervention to look to see if there was any changes um, in the correct responding. Mm-hmm. following books and or food. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's interesting to note that they use delayed multiple baseline design across participants. And I love when people put delayed. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that, Diana? Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, to me, it looks like it was a non-concurrent multiple baseline design, which the, is now arranged um, perhaps according to when sessions occurred in actual time. But it's a little difficult to know. Right. Right? I never really understand when someone writes the delayed in the front. Mm-hmm. But it's it's, it's, an, it's not a concurrent it, multiple right. baseline design. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's not concurrent. Right. So it's really unclear when each participant right. started and ended. Right. So, you know, we have uh, Katie w- was the first participant, and she did about six sessions of baseline and then started intervention. And then Abigail was a second participant, and she had about 10 sessions of baseline, but the way that they have it laid out in the graph, her baseline data starts at session six, where Katie's baseline data end, despite her having a longer phase of baseline. So I don't know if that means that, you know, six days in, they started baseline with her, or if, you know, these two data sets were collected at completely different points in time, and then they are arranged now. Mm -hmm. Um, into just, this baseline. Just right. the visual inspection component of it. Right. right. Yeah, and you do see the same result when you look between Abigail and Evan. So when Abigail, who is the middle participant, when her baseline ends, that is when Evan's, the third participant, or the bottom graph, starts. Hmm. Um, and he does have a longer baseline. So right. what you see, you see the same kind of, you see the same uh, display of data where when Abigail's baseline ends, 
Evan's baseline begins. Right. And it's important to note that they um, counterbalance the conditions of food and books Mm -hmm. um, differently for each participant. So for Katie, uh, we started with books. So it went books, food, books, food. Um, And Abigail, it went food, books, food, books. And then for Evan, it went books, food, books, food. So Mm. there's something to note. Yeah. Um, So then if each... No, if they had staggered the length of the initial baseline, why not line them all up? Right. Along, you know, session one, and then just indicate to us it's a non-concurrent multiple baseline. Right. I'm so, not sure I understand why. But. Me neither, but I... but So that's just something to think about and mm-hmm. ponder. Yeah. Um, okay. But what we do see in the pre-observation intervention, at least uh, for maintenance tasks, is that for all participants, uh, responding, correct responding is high contingent um, on food delivery, Mm -hmm. and fairly low contingent on book delivery. Um, We do see, I mean, fairly variable responding in that first phase for Katie, where she has, you know, between two and, or between zero and 16 responses. Um, But overall, it's a, a, it's a fairly low level. So yeah, so following, I mean, you know, before observation, books did not serve as a reinforcer. And then following observation, uh, for all of the participants, it's so surprising, but correct responding increases (laughs) across all phases. So it's high in books and high in food, uh, uh, the contingent books and contingent food. Um, And that's just so incredible to, I mean, to see. It it just... It reads like it's too good to be true. <laughs> right. You know, especially, you know, following the last article where it was like, oh, I know everyone tried really hard and like maybe 50% of the time it will work. This one. Yeah, I don't know. Just kind of looked at books and uh, there you go. You yeah. did it. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I really love that they didn't um, just look at maintenance tasks, but mm-hmm. then they also followed it up with looking at acquisition tasks to really assess if books would function as a reinforcer. Yeah. Um, and in the pre-observation intervention, we saw, you know, really low responding um, across tasks. Um, they had three tasks, three different tasks with book contingent mm-hmm. on the correct responding. And then following the observation, we do see an increase in responding for all three tasks when book was contingent on, mm-hmm. uh, was contingent on the responding. So that's pretty amazing. Although it didn't, jump quickly it's more of a slow increase um but yeah they, this was acquisition though right yeah but it got there and yeah. so it really never crossed baseline levels which is kind of neat yeah yeah and that, well then they also i know looked at percentage of time that the that the children would then interact with books during actual play play time right so they did that but this part here i know it's an extension I would have loved to see more. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the graph, you see that only one participant engaged in any um, book engagement. Looking. Yeah, book looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at books. Ooh. Uh, book Scholarly looking. pursuits, I yeah. would call it. In the pre-observation intervention. Um, and what I really... I, I'm glad to see in the post-observation intervention... All of the participants engaged in some book looking mm-hmm. um, during that free play setting. But it's a little concerning to me that they only um, took data on one session. Mm-hmm. Right? So books right. could function as a reinforcer immediately following that observation. But does that mean that they're going to last over you know, mm-hmm. is that they're going to persist as reinforcers over time? So I would have kind of liked to see maybe two or three more probe sessions Mm -hmm. um, during that free play to really strengthen the assertion that, yes, books do serve as reinforcers and not just this temporary increase because of, Mm -hmm. you know, someone else got my junk. Right, exactly. (laughs) That's a a good point, Jackie, the sense of it's it's great to see that they had these results, but how much of it is going to have, uh, you know, continue over time. Yeah, I think the the funny thing is as much as I think we really like looking at the at the graphs and see the demonstration of the reinforcing effect of books. It's more, you know, certainly I, I, I imagine most parents, if you told them, oh, their their responding has gone up, they would care less. But the idea of I put my child in the playroom and they went to the books and they've never right. done that before is going to be 
the the important part. Right. Much more socially valid. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I, it would be nice to see that that was something that, and you sort of hope it would, like, oh, well, if they learn to, the books function as reinforcers, well, what about it? Is it just the, kind of as we'll get into the discussion, the, hey, that jerk's got something I want <laughs> factor? Do they suddenly, you know what? I never paid as much attention to these books, and they're visually stimulating, or, right. uh, you know, I'm able to contact some social contingency that I wasn't before, because now people could read the books to me. You would hope, but right. there's, you know, nothing to to. Well, it's not part of the not part of the study, right? So if I was going to replicate the study, um, I would do a concurrent multiple baseline design. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably use their same procedures. I think they're you know, I think it warrants replication. Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then I would extend their extension by doing multiple probes um, across multiple free play settings. Yeah. Um, for like a week, two weeks, maybe a month to see if you know the effects are long lasting. Mm. Maybe I will. <laughs> do it seems it. like a simple. A simple, a simple but but important piece of, right. the, of the study. Yeah, um, and another, the final graph that they have in here really doesn't necessarily pertain to the results, but it demonstrates that um, when uh, the Confederates were receiving the reinforcers, um, were the target students like. Attempting to access the book, so I like that trying to like grab for them, trying to ask for them. I'm glad that they put that in there. I mean, it, it's it's. I think Evan's data are really interesting because initially um, he did not attempt to get right. the books at all, and then over time you can see his attempts to access the books increase. Right, but his correct responding actually pretty much stays the same. Mm-hmm. It's a little variable, but yeah. you know, yeah. mostly it stays the same. But yeah, so that's kind of interesting. I bet Evan's mom loves that. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you guys ready to go into the why? Why any of this happened? Because yeah. I was fascinated <laughs> to hear what is it going to be? What's the magic that's going on in this in this study? And it kind of came down to and Jack, you're you're you, you two are both experts, but I know this is an area of of, of you know observational learning, and, and right. it's been uh, an observational invention, something that you've you've done done your own research on mm-hmm. as part of your dissertation. Uh, the uh, people are kind of jerks hypothesis. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right. So the authors say it in a much more professional way. They say one possible explanation for these findings is that the presence of the peer or the peer's interest in an object was discriminative for a loss of opportunity to play with that item, thus creating a motivating operation by which the toy momentarily became a desired object, which makes complete sense. Yeah. So I was trying to think about how we could extend this um, using siblings, right? Like, oh, God, yes. Anything that <laughs> anyone else has, like you want, even with my dogs, like... One dog has a toy, and that uh, my older dog has never played with that toy in like ten right. years, and he's like, "Ooh, mm-hmm. I'm yeah. getting it." Yeah. So that I mean, it does that makes makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I would want to see because Diane and I were talking about it in the context of uh, compulsive compulsive buying or, or some compuls- oh, yeah. compulsive behaviors. You know, yeah. specifically talking about our budget and why am I constantly buying garbage that I then don't do anything with? <laughs> right. And you know, w- what is it? Is it that I'm reinforced? For the ages. Yeah. <laughs> am I reinforced by these things I'm buying? Or, and on its face, I'm probably not because I just like I got this and I stick it in the closet. Or right. is it the signal of this is on sale or this is on clearance, which means it's going to go away forever and I can't have access to it. So I, I you know, have to j- have to jump on those savings. You know what, what? They're not savings. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not to They're the years. opposite of savings. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be interesting to look at, especially as as I think we're increasingly in a culture of it's so so easy to get what you want when you want it. So could we look at look at that component? Oh, I don't know if you told someone, oh, you're only getting it because you're scared of losing it. Does that change your behavior? I think it might mm-hmm. actually. I mean, it sets up it sets up the motivating operation, right? So when I can't have something. Then I probably want it more. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think um, you know, coming to this article from the last one and trying to sort through stimulus stimulus pairing and response stimulus pairing, and then you get you get here, and it's neither. Right. It's not stimulus stimulus pairing. It's not response stimulus pairing because it's it's not stimulus stimulus pairing because there is no primary reinforcer being delivered. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's not response stimulus pairing because while the um, participants are emitting a response, they are receiving no direct reinforcement. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's also not observational learning. Right. <laughs> because mm-hmm. they're not... Right. 
it's just the intervention because they're not observing uh, the discriminative stimulus that will occasion positive reinforcement in the mm-hmm. presence of that correct response. Yeah. Now, do you think that would have made a difference in the in in the results? I think that they wouldn't be able to so clearly state um, that it's due to just the observation yeah. because then it could have been due it to changes indication. the mm-hmm. question. Right. It changes the question and it kind of murkies the water mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah. So that's why they were so clear not to have the target um, observe the response of the confederate because then you don't know in the acquisition if it's because they learn through imitation or because they learn because of the reinforcer. Okay. Yeah. Bam. All right. Boom. So some good ideas for for future research, future replication with this. Uh, I kind of want to do the study, what, what was it, that 75% of uh, problem behavior, I think it was, was related to the fact oh, that someone else... <laughs> I have that for you. ...had something. Oh, yeah. and Ross in 1982... Mm-hmm. Um, studied 21 month olds, so <laughs> babies that are not yet two, and found that 75% of their conflicts were over toys. Where's the ex- I want to see what, uh, I want to see but, a graph. What is that over time? Oh, how does it change? Is it 75%? You know, you're going to see that till. Ever. You know, till they're 50. And then yeah. maybe if it drops. siblings, off. yeah. I think it just continues at the same rate. Um, but the, the secondary point, which is the best part, is that. These conflicts occurred when identical objects were readily available, <laughs> and after the conflict was over, the victor rarely played with the toy in question. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's there's me and why I buy stupid objects. I don't want them because I want them. I want them because I don't have them. The only reason you want it is because you can't have it. Right. The research shows you that is normal be human behavior, have- Diana. <laughs> yeah. It's completely acceptable. But, I mean, I'm an organism. I, I follow these rules, just like everyone. There are a lot of contingencies. <laughs> That's true. If you're there, there's certainly a discriminative stimulus for some sort of punishment if I continue to <laughs> buy the object. So it does lower my responding in that in that regard. Good. <laughs> Not really, audience. <laughs> it's, I've attenuated. So another thing that they didn't look at in this article, back to the article, <laughs> is whether peers themselves actually functioned as the condition reinforcers, even though they weren't classmates. Mm-hmm. We don't know if there was a history between the peers mm. um, and the They weren't the recessed owners. together, I think right, they you mentioned. Never know. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's an area of future research that we could look at, um, you know, look at familiar peers and unfamiliar peers um, and see if that has any effects. Hmm. Yeah. I just think it's really interesting. I actually think I might want to replicate this study in a daycare setting and see if I, with typically developing kids, and see if I can get the uh, same result. Mm -hmm. Um, But it'll be hard to find kids that don't um, like books. So I might need to find something more neutral. You could use, Mm -hmm. yeah, you could use all sorts of things. Yes. Just a more socially appropriate toy. Right. Yeah. Well, before we uh, finish up with any final thoughts on this article, I do want to give out our second code word secret word for the episode and it is maple m-a-p-l-e maple any final thoughts on this article i think we hit it i think we hit it but i think our next stop is a dissemination station (laughs) all aboard (laughs) trains pulling in (laughs) what are we disseminating i think we talked kind of along the way Mm -hmm. about some of our dissemination ideas. Um, Mm -hmm. But now that we're on the dissemination station train, um, to reiterate, both of these studies, I think, um, almost beg to be replicated with other populations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And with other stimuli, other items. If you replicate the second one, Jackie, can you just title it The Magic of Books? (laughs) I just <laughs> and then like the reading rainbow guy will be like right there. I feel like LeVar Burton reading would totally pay rainbow. for your uh, for your research just to just to have that be the be the, the conclusion. Absolutely. Books are magic. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll actually insert the more you know yeah. star <laughs> so we get everything in there. <laughs> Great idea. So the take home points really are we don't know which is better. Stimulus, stimulus, or response, stimulus, pairing. But according to our first article, response, stimulus, pairing may be more effective for some learners. Um, We also talked here about looking at other potential condition reinforcers that we could use besides books or slightly bizarre praise statements, (laughs) right? Yeah, so I think we found some really interesting results today that, and our main take-home point is that really get out there and do some research. Mm. Get some replication. Get your replication on, fools. That's right. 
Luda. <laughs> There's oh, a lot to be done snap. with condition reinforcers. <laughs> right. It's a really important area, actually. Mm. And these studies are good, but there's a lot more that we could do. Right. And um, we should do it. We should. Okay. Well, let's get going. That's enough of this podcast. We, we got to go. We got to get some research going. Well, thank you so much, uh, Diana. Thank you so much, Jackie, for being here. We hope you all enjoyed our second episode of the show. <laughs> Remember, if you are interested in listening to us for the pure joy of education, please, please continue to listen. You can find us on iTunes and on Stitcher. Please subscribe to the show. If you liked the show, you can send us an email at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. You can also go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash abainsidetrack or follow us on Twitter at abainsidetrack. And again, if you're interested in listening uh, for CEs, please go to the website at abainsidetrack.com for the full instructions. Uh, and then, Jackie, I know you had uh, another another announcement you wanted to, to make. Yeah, so if you are interested in pursuing a degree, you know, a career in behavior analysis, I strongly encourage you to check out the MS in Applied Behavior Analysis at Regis College. It's, it's a really awesome program. You can do it in two or three years, uh, work full-time or part-time, and get to hang out with me. That's right. <laughs> on a weekly basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not just bi-weekly. <laughs> Please join us next week for our preview episode where we'll be letting everyone know our research. And then join us in two weeks for a new episode of ABA Inside Track. But until then, please keep responding. Goodbye. Bye. Luda. Luda.